Your liver lives under your right rib. Your liver is the largest internal organ in the human body. It is the only organ in the body that has the ability to regenerate or regrow. As we go through this lecture, you'll see why God made it so. Let's have a look at the liver. You may have seen pictures of your liver. Basically looks a little bit like this. And your liver, as the project manager, determines what and how waste comes out of your body. And your liver, as your project manager, also has jurisdiction over everything that comes into the body. So let's first of all look at food. Never in the history of mankind have human beings eaten so many carbohydrates. What are carbohydrates? Let's make an assessment here. Carbohydrates. What would most Australians have started the day with? We know because there's a whole aisle devoted to it. Cereal. Cereal is Aussie's favourite breakfast. And sometimes toast. You can buy bread in every corner shop. It's a very abundant food. And because cereal and bread doesn't take you far, mid-morning, many are going to the cakes, the biscuits, maybe a pie. Australians love their pies. And Europeans have introduced Australians to pizza, another fast food, and pasta, the very popular pasta. I'm a fifth generation Australian with Scottish descent. I didn't know what pasta was till I was about 18. I don't think there's an Australian today that doesn't know what pasta is. Popular food. Rice. Asians have introduced Australians to rice. Potatoes. My husband's an Irishman. He loves potatoes. And then last and certainly least in nutritive value is the pure crystallised acid that was extracted from the sugarcane field. Would you agree with me? Australians are high carbohydrate consumers. This morning I talked about the gastrointestinal tract. I talked about how it's a hollow tube and anything that goes into that hollow tube is not part of you or me until it gets broken down to tiny substances and then absorbed into the blood. Well, it is the liver that determines where that tiny substance goes. It is glucose. All of these foods break down in the gastrointestinal tract to glucose. Once glucose gets into the blood, it goes on the M1 main highway straight to project manager. It's called the portal vein. And then the project manager, your liver, determines where that glucose goes. The first place it will send glucose is to the cell. Let's have a look. Here is cell. Glucose gets sent into the cell. When it goes into the cell, it goes through a 20-step pathway. And that 20-step pathway gives us two units of energy. And I think we all realise that that's what glucose is for, for energy. The end result of that 20-step pathway is a chemical form of glucose called pyruvate. Pyruvate is the chemical form of glucose that gets fed into the powerhouse, called the powerhouse because this eight-step pathway delivers to us a whopping 36 units of the big E energy. Whoa, what a difference. And why the difference? The difference is oxygen. This pathway uses oxygen. This pathway does not use oxygen. For the technical amongst us, this is the glycolytic pathway. This is the mitochondria, specifically the Krebs cycle. What a difference oxygen makes. By the way, how are you going to feel if every single one of your 100 trillion cells has got enough oxygen coming in so that it can get down to there? You're going to feel good. We're not going to be able to hold you down. But we're, going, we're not going to look at oxygen today. We're going to look at oxygen tomorrow. Right now, we're looking at the fate of glucose. 
So number one, the first place that the liver will send this glucose is to the cell to be burnt as fuel. But on a high carbohydrate diet, there is still a lot of glucose left over. And so now, this is specifically the muscle cell, it stores this glucose like a little bunch of grapes. They're little molecules of glucose and they're called glycogen. Glycogen is a name given to quick release glucose stores. That is what our body uses on our morning walk. I don't know about you, but when I get up in the morning, I have a few glasses of water and then I go for my morning walk. Do you ever wonder where you get the energy to do your morning walk when all you've had is water? It is your glycogen stores, specifically in your muscle cell. And those glycogen stores in your muscle cell, it's like they're in a prison. They can only be used by your muscle cell. But the liver can store glycogen too. And the glycogen stored in the liver can be used all over the body. So it can be a fantastic reserve supply for your brain. But on a high carbohydrate diet, releasing a lot of glucose, we still have glucose left over. Even when it's been th fed through the energy cycle, even when it's been stored as glycogen, and only so much glycogen can be stored. Now the body, specifically the liver, sends it over to the most amazing fuel depot in the human body. It's called fat. And in many Aussies today, the glucose keeps coming and the body, as we talked about earlier, gets into a habit and shunt, shunt, shunt. The glucose gets into the habit of all just going over to the fat cells. And what's happening to most Aussies today? They're getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Did you know that we've overtaken America? 63% of Australians are today overweight or obese. So this is the third place that the liver sends the glucose to be stored as fat. This is a fact many do not realize. It was only about oh, six months ago, Time Magazine, front page of Time Magazine, it said, butter, why we were wrong on the fat. And a recent Catalyst show said, its title was Fat or Fiction. It is starting to be acknowledged what I'm showing you today that fat's not the problem. The problem is this high carbohydrate diet that many Aussies are consuming is being stored as copious amounts of fat. And often when people want to lose weight, they stop the fat. But the fat's not the problem. The problem is this high carbohydrate diet forcing the body to store the excess as fat stores. And so what happens now is the person's getting big and it could be like a man I met about a year ago who told me that he went to his doctor and his doctor said, you're overweight, your blood pressure's too high, your cholesterol levels are too high, your blood pressure's going too high, you're going to have to go on some medication. He said, just, just let me... Um, just let me see what I can do first. And the doctor said, okay, I suggest you stop all fat in your diet. He went home. He was only having a little bit of fat. He stopped the fat. And when the fat stops, the person gets hungry. And so they eat a lot of carbohydrate. That's what usually happens because that's one of the roles of fat in digestion is to give the feeling of satiation or satisfaction. He said three months later, he went back to the doctor. He'd lost one kilo. What does that mean when you're 150 kilos? Not much. <laughs> doctor said, no, no, no. We're going to have to put you on medication. Lee said, nah, give me, give me another try. 
He said, I'm a business analyst. And if something doesn't work, you don't keep doing it. He said, so I went home and did a Google search. I came up with the paleo diet. I came up with the gap diet. I came up with grain brain. I came up with bodybuilding.com. He said, I came up with the FODMAT diet. I came up with Atkins diet. And he said, what got me about all of these authors, majority of them doctors, with many years of clinical practice up their sleeve, they're all saying the same thing. And what does the proverb say? In a multitude of counsellors, there is safety. They are all saying that the problem's not the fat, the problem is the carbohydrates. So he said to me, I thought, what have I got to lose? So he said, I decided to try it. It sounded a bit extreme, but he said, I, I had nowhere else to go. So he said, I dropped all my carbohydrates, no grain, no grain at all. Majority of these are grain. And he said, I dropped the potatoes. He said, I had a food program that was high in fiber. Where's he getting all his fiber from? Vegetables with the exclusion of the potato. He said, I had a lot of vegetables. He said, I also had quite a substantial amount of protein. Where was he getting his protein from? He was getting his protein from meat, eggs, cheese, butter. He said, I was also having, as you can imagine, quite generous amounts of fat in the butter, in the cheese, in the cream, in the eggs. He said, the weight just fell off me. He said, I got quite excited. He said, I was quite happy with this food program because he said, I was never hungry. You see, there are three food groups that keep the food in the stomach longer. One is fiber. It keeps the food in the stomach longer because all glucose is, glucose is bound up in fiber and fiber slowly releases the glucose. And that's what we want to keep us going between meals. You see, protein keeps the food in the stomach longer because it is in the stomach that protein is broken down. And fat keeps the food in the stomach longer because fat coats the meal and slows down the digestive en enzymes a little, breaking down the food. He said, I was never hungry. The weight just fell off me. He said, I had heaps of energy. You see, if you are not giving this quick energy release carbohydrates to the body, the liver specifically can break down your fat stores to give you glucose, and it has the ability to break down protein and fat to give you glucose if there's nothing else. It's called gluconeogenesis, producing new glucose from the stores. He said, I went back to the doctor six months later. The doctor hardly recognized me. He said, in six months, I had lost almost 50 kilos. Wow. <laughs> he said, the doctor took my blood pressure. Normal. He took my cholesterol. Normal. He took my blood sugar. Normal. Doc said, keep up that low fat diet. It's doing you well. <laughs> Lee said, I decided not to tell him because I wanted to get this to its full, I wanted to see it fully through. But doctor did not even mention medication. He was balancing it really well. You see, these three food groups are the essential food groups. Essential because fibre is absolutely necessary for the colon to keep things moving. If things don't move, the body shuts down. It also helps to keep, it does house cleaning in the colon by sweeping out all the grooves. And it is the fiber content or the fiber part of most of your grains where you'll find your B vitamins, essential vitamins. Protein is essential. You see 50% of the membrane around every cell in the body is protein. In our last lecture, we looked at the DNA. We looked at the crossword bands that are made up of amino acids, a breakdown from the protein that you eat. We looked at the new cell being made, made from amino acids, which is the breakdown from the protein that we eat. That's a pretty important part. In fact, you take all the water away, protein is the most abundant substance in the body. 
50% of the membrane around every cell in the body is fat. Fat is an essential nutrient. This is true for every membrane, even the membrane around the nucleus, the membrane around the Krebs cycle, all 50% fat, except for the brain. The membrane around the brain cell is 70% fat. Whew, that makes it pretty important. Our sex hormones are, are a breakdown from the fat. Our, our stress hormones are also a breakdown from fat. That makes fat pretty, pretty important. At a later date, I'm going to look at fats and I'm going to define fats because there are fats that are dangerous and there are fats that are healing. But because there are dangerous fats, sadly, all fats have been lumped into the one basket. But as the nutrition world is starting to see, and as all these authors I just quoted to you show, fat is essential. Your fat-soluble vitamins cannot be accessed unless you're eating them with fat. The non-essential might surprise you. The non-essential food group is carbohydrates. Carbohydrates are not bad. What a relief. We certainly like these foods. Carbohydrates are not bad. Carbohydrates are not even dangerous. No, no, no. It's only when they are refined and overdone that the danger arises. Because with the refined carbohydrates and the overdone carbohydrates causing the body to store it as fat, this is fat build up on the internal organs. This is fat build up on the, on the inactive parts of the body. Because your carbohydrates are your non-essential and in the catalyst program, fat or fiction, there was a professor there who said, let me make it very, very clear, you can live without it. But as the non-essential, that's your negotiating part of your, of your food. Don't negotiate your fibre, protein and fat, they're essential. It's the carbohydrates that are the negotiating part. And the negotiations change depending on your age, depending on your height, depending on your size, depending on your fitness, depending on your physical, mental output through the day. So the other part where negotiations is a very important part with carbohydrates is health status. Earlier we looked at how cancer cells feed on glucose. It's their favourite food. So if someone wanted to conquer cancer, that would be the first food group they would drastically drop. If someone wanted to lose weight, they would drastically drop. If someone wanted to conquer diabetes, drastically drop. And tomorrow I'm going to show you how this plays out in diabetes. If someone wanted to conquer a yeast presence in their body, drastically drop. And it's not forever. I've seen many people drastically drop it, get a turnaround in their cancer, and then little by little start to implement it again. It's not forever. It's just for a period of time to get a certain result out of the body. Now with Lee, I did mention his protein was from animal sources and his fat from, was from animal sources. And I'm a vegetarian. You can do superior to animal protein and animal fat on a vegetarian diet. How? Let's have a look at this. I'm going to show you vegetarian protein here. So we've got the food, we've got the protein content of the food, and we've got the carbohydrate content of the food. And we're going to go to Genesis 129, where God tells Adam and Eve the best food. And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb-bearing seed which is upon the face of the earth. What's a herb-bearing seed? That's a grain. And we have so many grains to choose from today. We've got wheat, rye, barley, oats, amrath, buckwheat, millet, quinoa, so many grains. Grains are high in protein and they are quite high in carbohydrate. Let's go to our carbohydrate list. 
and see how many are from the grain department. So we've got grain, 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 grain. So the majority on our carbohydrate list are from the grain department. No wonder they're high carbs. Another herb bearing seed is the legume. What's a legume? That's your lentil, chickpeas, lima beans, black eyed beans, cannelloni beans, kidney beans, soy, split peas, so many legumes. Legumes are high in carbohydrate and medium to low in carbohydrate. You will find most low carb advocates put the legume and the grain together, but they are not. The fact is legumes are approximately a third the carbohydrate content that you will find in your grains. Another herb bearing seed is the seed. So that's your pumpkin seed, sesame seed, sunflower seed, chia seed, flaxseed or linseed. Seeds are high in protein and they are quite low in carbohydrate. And God said, behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed which is upon the face of the earth and every tree in the which of the tree is a fruit bearing seed. What's a fruit bearing seed? That's your nut. So your nut comes from the fruit of a tree. We live on a wonderful part of the planet. We're the only country in the world that can afford to eat macadamia nuts. Beautiful nut. One lady said, aren't they high in fat? I said, that's right. Isn't that good? Fat's an essential nutrient. One lady told me she was on a diet and she's allowed one macadamia nut a day. I said, I have 10 a meal. It's not the fat's not the problem. We've got walnuts, pecan nuts, Brazil nuts, hazelnuts, almonds, so many nuts. Nuts are high in protein and quite low in carbohydrate. So my suggestion is with this information to ensure that you're getting your three essentials and to ensure you don't overdo your non-essential, my suggestion is that you increase the legume, nut, seed part of the meal and decrease the grain part of the meal. That is an easy way to help get the balance on a vegetarian diet. And we have seen many people conquer many diseases by going on the low carb diet on a vegetarian diet by mostly decreasing the grains and increasing the legume, nut and seed part of the meal. That's an easy way to do it. And you can do that very effectively on a vegetarian diet. Most vegetarians don't explore the wonderful legume. Most people say, oh, but you have to soak it. I said, that's right, go home and soak saucepanfuls. In the morning, rinse them, cook them, rinse them again, bag them in little bags in your freezer. Then you've got a whole freezer full. All they're waiting for is a delicious sauce. That's easy. Most people stop the fat because of cholesterol. What I'd like to show you now is the truth about cholesterol. Cholesterol is made by the liver and 80% of the cholesterol that the liver makes is made from glucose and 20% of the cholesterol that the liver makes is made from fat. Looking at this equation, if you want to get your cholesterol levels down, what food group would you drop? It's not the fat. <laughs> And this is one thing that Lee found when he was going, was on his high animal protein and fat diet, his cholesterol levels came down. Dr. Atkins showed in the 80s that dietary cholesterol has little or no effect on blood cholesterol levels. And was it about a year ago, Catalyst did a program on cholesterol and it showed very clearly in there, well documented, that cholesterol is not the issue. 
Dr. Dwight Lundell, cardiovascular surgeon, has written an e-book called The Great Cholesterol Lie. He's done 10,000 bypasses and he's written a book showing cholesterol is not the issue. We have a book in our library by uh, Dr. Dingle, Dr. Peter Dingle, and it's called The Great Cholesterol Deception. What I want to show you now is the role that cholesterol plays in the blood. You've heard of high density lipoprotein and low density lipoprotein, LDL. We are told LDL is the bad cholesterol and HDL is the good one, but the body doesn't make anything bad. They just have different roles. HDL is the carrier. It carries away excess cholesterol. That's why it's seen as the good guy and you can see that. LDL is the repairer and the rebuilder. Important to note this as I show you how they work together in the capillary maintenance. They're like the road workers in your body, the road workers of your blood system. Let's have a look at how they do it. Here's the blood, a blood vessel. And because of its low density, low density lipoprotein is always on the edge. Because of its high density, high density lipoprotein is found right in the middle. Now let's say the person's smoking cigarettes. The nicotine weakens the cells even to the point of a hole can be made in the blood vessel. Let's say the person smoking, well we've said the smoking, breathing in from a mouldy pillow or mouldy carpet in the bedroom. The fungus in the blood can poke a hole in the blood vessel. Let's say the person's got a mouthful of mercury fillings. Mercury is a neurotoxin and it is also able to poke a hole in that blood vessel. Who's going to fix the hole up? Your repairer and your rebuilder, LDL, plugs up the hole. Now what's supposed to happen? The suppo person's supposed to get all their mercury fillings out and stop eating so much tuna. And shark, the, the larger the fish, the higher the concentration of mercury. The person's supposed to uh, throw out their mouldy pillows or pull out their mouldy carpet in their bedroom and put tiles down. The person's supposed to stop smoking. And at the same time, they're supposed to be eating nourishing foods. Your vegetables are high in fibre, high in minerals, low in sugars. They're the healers. There's your high fibre. Protein. You need those building blocks to heal. Good fats to nourish that cell wall. So when a person gets rid of what's causing it and has nourishing food, then the body can heal the whole. And HDL comes along and picks up the excess and takes it away. That's how they work together in maintaining your blood network. But sadly today, many people are unaware of the dangers of mercury. Many people don't realise what the cigarette smoke is doing to their, to their arteries. Many people don't realise the dangers of mould. And they're so busy that they just eat fast food that is very low in nourishment. And so what's happening in the blood vessel? It's building up and up and up and up. And the arterial wall, it, it's, the artery is actually getting narrower and narrower. It's called atherosclerosis. When I used to work in the operating theatre, we did a bypass one day and the surgeon cut out the piece of artery that was all clogged. And then he got some tweezers and he started to pull what was clogging and it was like i never forget it, it was like gristle, like cream gristle. And they say, ah, cholesterol. But you know what we should be asking? Why is it there? Why is it there? And if the cholesterol levels are high, we have to ask, why is the liver making so much? It will only make it in accordance to the demands on the body. Is it because the body's being damaged for various reasons? Remember, he's the repairer and the rebuilder. And so the person is put on Lipitor or Crestor, which is cholesterol-lowering medication. And that cholesterol-lowering medication blocks the pathway in the liver that the liver uses to make cholesterol. That's how it gets the cholesterol levels down.
But that same pathway is the pathway that the liver uses to make coenzyme Q10. Coenzyme Q10 is your heart protective enzyme. So a person can go on Crestor or Lipitor in the hope of preventing a heart attack and actually increase their susceptibility because they've now lost their heart protective enzyme. There's no need to go on that medication. A few more dangerous things that I want to tell you about Crestal and Lipitor, especially Lipitor. Lipitor, one of its side effects is, is uh, Alzheimer's, dementia. And I don't know anyone that wants to get that. Another side effect is muscle cramping and muscle wasting. No, the human body can heal itself and it will heal itself if you give it the right conditions, even to the point of balancing out cholesterol levels. So we've made an assessment on what the liver does with the food that comes into it. Now I want to show you what it does to something else a little bit more sinister that comes in. And this is environmental toxins. We are all subject to environmental poisons. They come into the body, they go into the blood, they come up to the project manager, and the project manager often says, oh, this is a nasty, nasty guy. Wrap him up in fat and store him. And so all through our life, when these environmental poisons come in, these fat-soluble toxins are stored in our fat cells. And then the person comes to Misty Mountain Health Retreat. And the person goes through a detox. They only have juices for a couple of days. Not enough glucose to run on. And so what the liver does, it starts breaking down some of the fat stores to give glucose for those extra energy needs. But something a little bit more sinister gets released. And I think most people are aware that when they go on a detox, their breath isn't as nice as normal, the body odor is a little worse than normal, what they're releasing into the toilet is a little worse than normal. It's because of the release of these fat soluble toxins. When these fat soluble toxins are once again in the bloodstream, they once again come up to the liver. Now, if it can, the liver will break that down to a water-soluble state. And that's what I want to show you now, how the liver does that. Phase one of the liver detox, the liver takes this fat-soluble toxin and it breaks it down to a metabolite. A metabolite, very simply, is the first stage of metabolism. And this metabolite is a little bit more complex than it originally was. This metabolite creates a lot of free radicals, which are damaging to the tissues. This metabolite is highly volatile, causing damage where it goes. This metabolite is sometimes a hundred times more toxic than it originally was. So you might claim, well, what's the liver doing? It's just created something that's far more toxic than it originally was. It's a process. It's like when I clean the kitchen cupboards out, my kitchen looks a hundred times messier than when I started. It's just a process. And your liver has certain needs at this stage. Your liver needs antioxidants because antioxidants have a nickname. They're called free radical scavengers. Your most potent antioxidants are beta carotene. And beta carotene is found in all your orange and your red colored vegetables. That's why at Misty Mountain Health Retreat, every juice we serve is either red or orange or green, high in beta carotenes. The most famous antioxidant is vitamin C. Vitamin C is known as ascorbic acid. And vitamin C as ascorbic acid is a potent, it's a potent antioxidant. It has a lot of extra electrons to balance out the free radicals. But Ascorbic acid by itself 
Once it has balanced out all the free radicals, it itself can become a free radical. But in nature, ascorbic acid is found with, with bioflavonoids. And research now shows that the bioflavonoids are continually feeding extra electrons to the ascorbic acid to protect it from becoming a free radical. Bottom line is, when you buy vitamin C, make sure your ascorbic acid has bioflavonoids with it. I'm going to write these two sideways because they are not antioxidants, but they are required in phase one of the liver detox, minerals and vitamin B. Before we move on, there is one more antioxidants, it's vitamin E. Vitamin E is a fat soluble vitamin and at Misty Mountain Health Retreat on the juicing days we serve protein drinks to our guests and that is where they'll find their vitamin E. Within 36 hours of starting a detox program phase two kicks in. So phase two takes this highly toxic highly volatile metabolite and joins it together with amino acids. The union of this highly toxic metabolite and the amino acids creates the water soluble state. As a water soluble state, it can be easily released out of the body and its symbol is a wave in a box. Phase three happens in conjunction with phase two. So phase three, the liver takes this water soluble state and it releases out via your urine, via your sweat glands and via your colon. They're the, probably the three main areas that this water soluble state can be released out of the body. This information has only been known since 2002. Any book written before 2002 will not have this information in it. I do not think at the time of his death that Dr. Atkins realized the full effect of his diet. I mean, his book was number one on the New York Times best-selling list four years running. Why? Because people were getting results. But I talked to a Dr. Benjamin in New York, who was Dr. Atkins' patient. He said, I believe if Atkins had read the China study, Atkins would have become a vegetarian. Because Colin Campbell shows in the China study the dangers of this high meat, high animal protein, high animal fat diet. And as I showed you previously, you can do it very effectively on a vegetarian diet. So the needs for phase two is protein to provide the amino acids. The needs for phase three are basically your fats. And in the protein drink that we serve our guests, we put coconut cream in it. So they're getting a very nice fat there, as I'll show you when we get to the fat lecture. What happens if a person goes on a fast and does not supply the amino acids necessary for the second stage of this detox, which begins within 36 hours? Well, if within 48 hours, no protein, no amino acids are supplied, the liver can suffer 25% liver function loss. That's your project manager. You don't want your project manager go down. Cancer cannot let, cancer cannot get a hold on the body if the liver is working in optimum conditions. We need more protein today than any generation that has ever lived on the planet. And Dr. Colin Candle shows very clearly in his book, The China Study, there is no danger with the vegetable protein. It's only with the animal protein. Vegetable protein is very clean burning fuel, very easily used by the body. In Florence Nightingale's book, she noted that if she had a very sick patient, someone who was almost on death's door, they responded to two things, beef tea and raw milk. Now what do beef tea and raw milk both contain? Protein. Now, we are not going to give our guests at Misty Mountain beef tea or raw milk. We'll give them protein drinks. 
The protein drinks that we supply are made out of a pea protein. I gave this lecture in America one year and the man said to me, this is very interesting, but he said, this is not for your lay people, this is for your academics. I said, lay people have livers too, you know. This is very important information for anyone living on planet Earth in 2014, 15, we're nearly in 15. Isn't it wonderful that if we give our body the right conditions, the liver has the ability to effectively detoxify us from environmental poisons because we all come in contact with them. You can almost not get away from them today. The liver is a remarkable organ, as you can see, with an amazing ability to revive and to heal if given the right conditions. So you can see from looking at this, it is important that the liver have lots of vegetables, especially your red and your green coloured vegetables. And it is also important that the liver have, have protein in the amino acids and also healthy fats. I'd like to show you now some of the things that the liver needs to revive, other than what I've shown you. There are some bitter herbs, one's called gentian. It's incredibly bitter, but you might have heard the old saying, bitter to the mouth, sweet to the stomach, sweet to the mouth, bitter to the stomach. Gentian's very bitter to the mouth, but it's very sweet on the stomach, and it's also an excellent herb for the liver. Dandelion. Dandelion is another bitter herb that can revive the liver. And St. Mary's thistle. Little by little, like the dripping tap on a stone, the livers heal and revive. And remember Psalm 104 verse 14, where the Bible says in the Psalm, God gave herbs for the service of man. So they're there to serve you. They come in and they are able to revive and stimulate this liver. Because remember, it can revive and it can heal. Also very important for the liver to have sunshine. Every day, the, the sun should get on the abdominal areas. So specifically, if a person has any liver problems. One lady said to me, what about if your gallbladder is gone? Hopefully your gallbladder is not gone. But if your gallbladder is not gone, sorry, is gone, all is not lost because the gallbladder, which basically sits under the liver, a bit like this, into the bile duct, it is a reservoir for bile. It's connected basically like that. It's a reservoir for bile. It is the liver that makes the bile and if the gallbladder is taken away, then the, the liver of course still makes bile and the bile goes straight from the liver down to the bile duct. And the bile is probably one of the main enzymes that help in the breakdown of fats in the body. Some people think it's fat that causes gallstones. Gallstones are like little stones that seem to accumulate in the gallbladder and if ever they start to pass that's incredibly painful. Some think that gallstones because a person's on a high fat diet but it is not so. You see if a person goes on a no fat diet the bile can literally stagnate in the gallbladder. So a no fat diet is more dangerous to the liver than a high fat diet though I'm not advocating a high fat diet. Both can be dangerous. So the liver likes fat, not a lot. And one of the best way to get our fats is the food that we eat, like your nuts and your seeds, your avocados, all contain excellent forms of fat. And the only two fats that I advocate that a person be eating freely, and even then in very small amounts, is your olive oil and your coconut oil. Coconut oil specifically is excellent for the liver, because it does not require bile. It's the only fat that does not require bile. Dandelion uh, stimulates the formation of bile, as does St. Mary's Sissel, as does gentian, because these bitter herbs all get a reaction from the liver. I talked about sun, putting the liver in sun. 
because the sun stimulates the blood supply to the liver. And if anyone has gallstones or has a liver that's not working well, castor oil compressors can be placed on the liver area. Castor oil penetrates very, very deep into the body and wherever it penetrates, it breaks up lumps, bumps, congestions, adhesions. Excellent for breaking up even uh, scar tissue. How do you make a castor oil compress? You would get a few layers of cloth, maybe like toweling, moisten it with castor oil. Now that might take about half an hour for the oil to moisten through because castor oil is very thick. And then you apply it to the liver area, which again is under your right rib. Cover that with plastic and often your clothes will hold it in place. My suggestion is to wear it for four or five hours in the day, maybe five days a week. And little by little that castor oil can break up any adhesions, lumps, bumps, tumours, cysts on the liver and it can little by little start to break down stones in the gallbladder. This is of course in conjunction with giving the liver the right conditions in the food groups that I have previously talked about. The things that harm the liver the most are the stimulants. So alcohol is one of the most dangerous substances to be taken into the liver and it is alcohol that breaks down to something that's a hundred times more toxic. That's why alcoholics, off, the two organs often that go down with an alcoholic are the brain and the project manager. So headquarters, the brain and the liver, the project manager. So psoriasis of the liver is not uncommon with, with alcohol abuse. All drugs affect the liver. Remember, he's the master chemist. He's the sieve. Everything that goes into the body goes first through the liver. So the more toxic the substance is coming in, the more the liver is harmed by that. Also, constipation can harm the liver because when the colon's not working well, you get some fermentation happening, put putrefaction. That affects the blood, which again has to go to the liver, and the liver's the one that has to deal with that. So you can have a happy liver by giving it the right, right nutrients, by giving it some bitter herbs, by putting a castor oil compress on it, giving it some sunshine. Make sure that it rests every night. You know, one way that you rest the liver is to not eat at night. When you eat a large evening meal, when you go to sleep, your stomach still has to work and putrefaction and fermentation happens because digestion is not happening as quickly. And again, any toxic waste that goes into the body has to be dealt with by the liver. You may have heard the old saying that we should have breakfast like a king, lunch like a queen and tea like a pauper. It is true. Exercise, very important for the liver. Because when you exercise, you increase the blood supply to the liver. When you exercise, your torso moving moves the liver. And as the liver's moved, it's strengthened and toned to perform its work. We talked about proper diet, dropping the carbs right down, increasing the fiber, protein and fats. Use of water. The liver cannot function properly. It cannot detoxify you effectively unless you are well hydrated. Every single function in the body requires water. So it's vital that a person be having adequate water. We lose out of the body a day 1.5 litres via the urine, 0.5 of a litre via the colon, 0.3 of a litre via the skin and 0.2 of a litre via the via the lungs. So very, that's a two and a half litre loss a day. And that's not on a day like today, which is very, very hot. So vital that we have enough water. And the other is trust. And as I mentioned previously, this takes in all the emotional and the mental aspects of disease. When someone is highly stressed all the time, creates, creating toxic metabolites in the body, they all get taken to the liver and have to be dealt there with the liver. So be kind to your liver. Your liver has been designed to take you a long way through your life and you will enjoy life much better if you've got a happy liver because you're giving it the right conditions. <music>